Thank you very much, Alistair. For the first time ever, the people of Scotland were given the power. The democratic power to decide whether to continue our relationship with our friends in the rest of the United Kingdom. With the ballot, not the bullet. By the people, not the lairds. After open debate, not behind closed doors. And I am so proud that people quietly, but with confidence, said no to independence. <laughs> and in numbers rarely seen in modern democracies, they said yes. But yes to partnership, yes to sharing, yes to our common endeavour, and yes with an open hand. Comfortable in our own skin, generous in our compassion, proud of who we are. It was a pleasure to stand with uh, Alistair Carmichael, with Danny Alexander, with Michael Moore, and with Charles Kennedy. Because in each, we have the architects of our win. Mike outfoxing Alex Salmond on the referendum process. Danny at the heart of Better Together. Alistair taking the message out to the country. And Charles. Well, Charles was Charles at his very best speaking from the heart to the people across Scotland. Thank you all. <laughs> and our campaigns on the ground show that the strength we have locally too, with our road to the referendum meetings, mass canvassing and street stalls, we led the referendum. We led that campaign in North East Fife, the Borders, the Northern Isles, Aberdeenshire, Argyll, the Highlands, West Edinburgh and Eastern Bartonshire. I'm, so, I'm pro proud, so proud, that we won in every single one of those seats. We had a big no vote, and we should be proud of that. <laughs> we weren't alone. I, uh, I don't know if you know that Jim Murphy did a tour of 100 high streets across the country. Jim Murphy from the Labour Party. He's got a very magnetic personality, certainly for the the nationalists from a 10 mile radius around, they used to gather around and provoke him. Uh, before we got on his iron brew crate in Cooper, which was the latest stop on his tour, we were looking round the high street, working out who the troublemakers were going to be. And he spotted the better together, they were, they were okay, he could cope with them. And then the nationalists with the salt tires draped over their shoulders and the biggest yes badges that you could possibly buy, he said he knew how to handle them. But he said, Willie, this, uh, that young man at the back there, he's potentially the troublemaker. Unshaven, jeans, T-shirt on. He's the one to watch out for. I said, Jim, let me introduce you to Connor. He works for me in my constituency office. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim was not alone. We worked with people across the party boundaries. So I want to be generous and recognise the contributions that they made from Joanne, Ruth, Murdo, Douglas, Gordon, and above all, Alistair Darling. We all put party differences to one side for the greater good. It was a grand alliance and a grand alliance that I'm proud of. But the real winner was change. Often with election campaigns, it is the discussions and the debate that shape the future as much as the actual result. People were crying out for change, and change is what they will get. You remember that our own Ming Campbell published our plans for home rule in a federal United Kingdom two years ago, a man ahead of his time. Ming's work built on our party's steel commission of nearly a decade ago that established the intellectual case for reform and hasn't been properly challenged since. Our plans have stood the test of time. And from initial intransigence to reluctant fellow travellers, everyone is now on board. We have built an unstoppable force for change. God, even Michael Forsyth is arguing for federalism now. We now stand on the verge of something really exciting. It's the most exciting transformation in the way our country is run. Everyone is a federalist now. Britain will never be the same again. <laughs> and Ming Campbell's commission advanced three principles. First is local power. So that we're able to seize the energy in communities to build the future that meets their needs rather than being directed by the man in the ministry. Second is to entrench the parliament so it's a more equal partner within the United Kingdom. 
But finally is fiscal power, delivered through the Scottish Parliament, raising the majority of the money that it spends. Controlling the purse strings means that we can have the flexibility and agility to do things differently if we choose. And with that brings the power to borrow so that we can make investments now for longer term returns. With these three principles, we can transform the way the country is run. Liberals believe that power is best exercised when it is spread and shared across the country. Change will not be satisfied if it is restricted from a journey from London to Edinburgh. That journey of change must carry on right up to the tip of Shetland, to the foot of Galloway and to the heart of Aberdeen. <clears throat> Our vision is one that has been chiselled in stone since Gladstone. Not lines in the sand to be washed away when it suits. Another great liberal, Beveridge, had his five evils. Squalor, ignorance, want, idleness and disease. The ambition of our change is to empower people and communities to tackle the great challenges of our time. Poverty, demographic imbalance and climate change. These are the great challenges that we face. Giving everyone a chance to get on, build a sustainable economy and protect our environment. These are the goals, the wins that are possible. That is our change. I want to tell you that in the run-up to the referendum, even when the debate was going on, we in Parliament were holding the Nationalists to account for running the country. With Jim Hume on NHS waiting times and mental health, with Tavish Scott on investing in transport links to the North East and the Highlands, with Liam MacArthur winning the battle for more childcare. And was, as was all too apparent this week, on armed police, Alison McInnes, is running rings round Kenny McCaskill. <laughs> we may be only five, but the nationalists know we are a mighty handful. Brit Britain will never be the same again, but I can assure you that the Liberal Democrats will never support a nationalist effort to create an unstable form of devolution as a ticking time bomb deliberately designed to deliver independence. So there is a test for the SNP. Will they be like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, torn apart by the lust for the ring of independence? Or will they work constructively with others to create home rule that is stable as well as powerful inside the United Kingdom? That is the real test. If they fail this test, the message to the voters will be clear. If you vote a nationalist to your parliament, don't be surprised if they do nationalist things. Don't be surprised if they continue to use every living moment to plot the breakup of the UK. Don't be surprised if they hoover up powers from across the country into their grasp and control. Don't be surprised if they blame London for all our ills, even when they have the power in their own hands. That's what they've done for 80 years. Same old, same old. So come on, SNP, give it a rest. It's time for a change. <clears throat> and we should have change coming. We should have change coming ahead at Holyrood. Nicola is replacing Alex, and she tells us that she is different. But how different a First Minister is she really going to be? She's a fan of Birgit Nyborg, the Liberal Prime Minister from the TV series Borgen. Aren't we all? How, but how liberal is Nicola? There are promising signs. She piloted the equal marriage bill through the parliament, but then she shared a platform with Brian Souter. She proclaims powerful human rights but then she defended our First Minister's refusal to meet the Dalai Lama. But would Birgit have supported stop and search of children, police carrying guns on our streets, hoovering up powers from communities? Is Nicola a Borgen liberal or a salmoned nationalist? The moment of truth is here. Will the real Nicola Sturgeon please stand up? I have a message 
for the Labour Party and the Conservatives too. To the Conservatives, your partners in Better Together did not appreciate your Prime Minister's opportunistic attempt to gain party advantage over votes in the House of Commons within minutes of the result of the referendum. Putting your party's interest ahead of the national interest almost wrecked a moment of great national unity. <laughs> and, and to Labour, I know you fear the consequences for the rest of the United Kingdom from substantial changes here, but the message from the voters is clear. People want substantial and meaningful change and they will settle for nothing less. That change must ripple through the rest of the United Kingdom. Now is not the time for timidity here in Scotland or across the UK. The response to the cry from the voters is to be bold and ambitious. That is the answer. <clears throat> Our party has a unique role in politics. We can put aside deep differences to work in partnership for the greater good whether it be Better Together, the Lib Lab coalition in the first eight years of Holyrood, the Westminster coalition, working with the SNP on budget investments for childcare and colleges. In forging a new agreement towards home rule and federalism, we have a critical role again. So my final message to the voters, if you are fed up of the politics of yes and no, of us and them, then we are your party. If you want to move on from the divisiveness, the tribalism, the bitterness and the bickering of the last three years, then we are your party. If you are a committed internationalist, a committed environmentalist and believe we can achieve more by working together than separating off, then we are your party. If you want a party that's worked for home rule, not for the last hundred days, but the last hundred years, then we are your party. If you want to stop the talk of the 45 or the 55 and talk about one Scotland, to take forward a programme of reform to unite the country, then we are your party. If you want all of these things, we are for you. The Liberal Democrats, the party of one Scotland.